Meditation is never about holding attention. It's always about returning attention. You know this stuff already. So the air is coming in and out. Your mind is gathering calmness and strength. Coherence and focus and mind strength are essential characteristics of your ability to learn anything, to participate in education of any kind. And although we associate meditative inner practices with religious lineages, it's also the case, as you might know, that many of the ancient words that we translate as monk meant something like learner, and so does the word disciple. A light relaxed meditative trance is an accelerated learning mode that gifts you with the mood and the capacity to more deeply receive and to make sense of information. Now this particular inner practice is very easy to do, so we don't always think about what it's accomplishing at the micro level and what kind of framing is implied by it. My own theory of the operative principle here is that the practice sets you up to encounter moments in which physical and mental attention are synergized. The neural subsystems that we call mind and body are activated together, and in many tiny moments and ways we start connecting them, we start tracking them both. The sensation and the ideation streams start to entangle or harmonize into a numinous surplus coherence greater than the sum of the parts, which we feel as an extra energy, or the presence of consciousness, or the nearness of vaster and more intriguing layers of subtle perception and meaning. We could make, and I have made, attempts to conceive our inherited human treasury of inner practices from the point of view of being able to retro-engineer them as varieties of the integration of these different modes of subjective neurobiological intelligence systems. I think all successful inner practices have an element of this, but there seem to be so many different kinds, so many different emphases, uh, many different contexts and traditions and experiments that human beings have made in regard to these psychotechnologies. And so we're forced to look at this hugely diverse set of different inner practices from the human species and wonder whether some of these are more or less useful to individuals, to societies, to moments of history, than certain other ways. And I want to point out how classically neutral this simple breath focus practice is. You're just watching the breath come in and out. It's just a fact that you can choose to put your attention on. And in that sense, maybe any fact would do. As they might say in Sanskrit, you can do dhyana and samadhi from dharana on any bindu. Right? You start with focus on a dot, focus on emptiness, focus on the tip of your left big toe. These are all good for you. They really are. They all prime your brain for something like unfolding wisdom and existential depth. But this neutrality might be typical of the great axial age approaches. The self-sacrificial and world-transcending doctrines produced several thousand years ago enjoy a certain neutrality that they contrast often against the vicissitudes and the emotional flux of human life. Often these systems, the background framing, the view of these systems, is seeking an ultimate impersonal condition that is indifferent to the cycles of life and death and change that make up the engine of mortal, finite, biological, and ecological circumstances in which we're embedded. But what if the framing was not impartial? What if we had a very particular means of selecting practices because we do not only want wisdom and self-unfolding and access to states of deep contentment and redemption, we also want healthy outcomes in all dimensions of life for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our species, for the entire interpenetrating living realm in which we're embedded. So what if the very thing that produces the ethic of compassion for sentient beings also starts to give us a conceptual tool with which to privilege some forms of inner practice over others, some stories or framings about inner practice over others, and how do we situate education in all of that? These are questions that we will not find the answers to today. They are relatively new or relatively rare inquiries, still barely formed. So our best bet, I think, is to feel many parts of this potential terrain and then go away from here and let that seep into our generative subconsciousness.
So we're doing this breathing exercise. We're working with the neutral fact of breathing. But breathing need not be framed as neutral, obviously. It's also the very breath of life. It's value-laden, intrinsically. Breathing favors something. It favors vitality, and it tries to minimize something else. Uh, weakness, suffering, dying. Respiration is also an inspiration, and not an inspiration that could go in any direction, but an inspiration that excites certain particular bio-emotions, certain particular organismic modes, particular ways of being in the world. And again, not just a random cosmic or social world, but this specific shared living world that we co-inhabit with all the other breathing creatures. We don't need to necessarily believe in the metaphor of a special life energy that comes in and out with the breath. But in any moment at a purely phenomenological level, we can sense that when we breathe out, something seems to remain. There's a not just a chemical gift of oxygen and nitrogen to the cilia of the lungs and to the bloodstream, but there's also a kind of stimulation that's involved. And if we pay subtle attention to the organism, we find that the organism perks up as the air is seemingly pulled deeper into us. There's something analogous here to cellular activation. It's very delicate. Some of us sense it more directly. Some of us imagine it. Some of us respond to the idea. Regardless of how vividly we can experience somatic interoception, this kind of focus, this kind of emphasis of inner practice is not a neutral interaction with one of the endless number of possible and equal perceptions. It's a very specific focus that places us viscerally and conceptually in alignment with a net positive collaboration between the myriad living systems of the earth. A very tiny shift in how we evaluate and talk about a breathing meditation. But this kind of tiny shift might over time determine whether our educational existential practice proceeds in tandem with a background of a neutral or illusory world or whether it unfolds in tandem with an evolving and attempting a value-aligned world, um, whose needs might then prescribe an ethics around our choice of inner practices. So I just wanted to start here with what is a subtle difference in framing between two versions of almost the same inner praxis. Now it'll be up to you to open your eyes or keep them closed for the rest of this little lecture. You technically will not need your eyes to hear me continue to talk. I'm thinking of uh, an old quote attributed to the poet Goethe, that if you carefully observe the life cycle of a single plant, you would basically know everything worth knowing. It would be a full education. And I'm not so much interested right now in what we might specifically learn from a plant's biography, but rather I'm interested in extending the implications of developing wisdom in tandem with dynamic living organic systems, of which flowers and plants are excellent examples. Careful detailed inspecting, sustained intentional attention, pondering, deeply receptive states of consciousness, these are all parts of general wisdom practice. But as we've been considering, they could be deployed in any area of life, and the choice may make a difference. You can activate inner functions that start to convert mere knowledge and experience and skill building into something like understanding, into something like being, but you could do this in many different contexts. It could be mathematical, scholarly, it could be the dance hall, it could be the city, it could be the forest. There are many situations in which to explore our faculty for spirituality or depth or self-transcendence. But I'm hoping we can start to think together about the relevance of privileging nature as that context. Joe Brewer thinks that it matters whether we organize our community building, our financing, our ongoing education around socially constructed blocks of land or around living bioregions. Right? I agree, that's a significant shift. And we can extend that kind of thinking by asking questions like, does it matter if you become a bodhisattva in a monastery or a forest? Does it matter if the objects of your attention practice are complex living systems or relatively inert objects or ephemeral digital patterns? What difference might it make if you turn for pondering practice to an ancient text versus turning to a garden? 
have questions like this been seriously asked? Now, I'm a fan of all different contexts for existential development and the renewal of shared spirit. But there's something in me that keeps feeling like the new wave of civilization, the planetary metaculture, the ethos that can actually mobilize to address the diverse overlapping and accelerating crises of the world has to be shamanic, meta-shamanic, neo-shamanic, something of that sort. And I don't mean by that that it's defined by its correspondence to particular indigenous paths or to a psychedelic revival or to the aesthetics of tribalism. I mean that our wisdom cultures, which are the extension and epitome of our educational cultures, might need to be ecological in their framing and fundamentally life-oriented, and that they might need to privilege multi-systemic, biodiverse, and psychodiverse flourishing, even though the results of many of our inner practices are states that seem to radically transcend everything, including our concept of what life is or what things are. These are compatible. And the phrase that comes to me for all of this is sacred naturalness, which for me means both the sacralization of the natural and the naturalization of the sacred. The naturalization of the sacred is understanding our inner life and our inner possibilities in ways that comport with the advancing natural sciences and the needs of the biosphere. And sacralizing the natural treats the quality of naturalness which is a complex and partly constructed quality, not merely pre-given, treats it as something holy, something with ethical implications and implications for how we organize our inner work and our attention. So Taoism is an interesting example of this. The way or the Tao is an insight and an obligation that is not a neutral void or simply a world outshining transcendence. It has the power of those things, but it's oriented to help cultivate particular complex flows that feel natural and enlivening and mediate between the human, the ecological, the geological, and the elemental domains. And to participate in alignment with the way, we need to do certain inner practices or adapt to certain attitudes, which then both require an education to undertake, but also make us more educable in our adaptation to the complex systems in which we are embedded. So in the spirit of sacred naturalness, for the next little while, I'm gonna give half a dozen stories or ideas or snapshots of ways we could begin to think more richly into this terrain. The first thing that stands out, I think very obviously, is that for the majority of human history, we did not do our religion, our self-development, our culture production, or our educational praxis in special buildings equipped with books. That is not to say books and buildings are problematic, but I think we need to appreciate that the historically normal circumstance for ongoing human and developmental education is nature, wilderness, woods, beaches, caves, mountains, rivers. We did it like that for anywhere between 30 and 200,000 years, and we've only just done books and buildings for a couple of thousand. Interestingly, even almost no Christian had read the Bible just a few hundred years ago. Contemporary forms of pedagogy are innovative and powerful, but they're also historically abnormal in a certain sense that's worth taking seriously. In the ancient normal educational contexts, we can say they're divided into two types. The first consists of immersion in group activities with technical and dramatic mm. mentorship, whereby you gain skill over time in whatever practical and social arts comprise clan life. And the second stream of ancient normal education were shamanic interventions, such as ordeals of maturation, participation in rituals, special one-on-one -on -one conversations, imaginal voyaging, esoteric lore, altered states, and inner practices. The second kind of education was mediated by figures who we often thought of as dwelling at the edge of the village, which is to say we thought of them as mediators between the human social technological domain on the one hand, and organic complexity and ecological domains on the other. They bridged between the two realms of patterning, which needs consistent, constant reciprocal adjudication and adjustment in order to synergize, which is to say in order to co-produce an edifying naturalness, rather than allowing these two realms to fall apart from each other into a stark, enervating choice between a harsh idiot wilderness or a painfully artificial, self-sabotaging social domain. A contemporary science like permaculture is a great example of this.
It's a human, social, and technological attempt to utilize, amplify, and preserve complex natural interactions. It's, it's that in distinction from making no interventions and in distinction from flattening natural richness into simplified human strategies. It's a kind of co-production between two patterning styles. And we can imagine the primeval human educator as operating as a kind of psychological, sociological, and physical permaculturalist. Uh, we might even want to pause here for a second, reflect on the fact that many contemporary approaches to understanding the cognitive machinery of human beings have started to explore the, the shamanic, the priestly, the mystical, the philosophical, and the yogic modalities as disciplines that make salient the root processes of perception, memory, subtle discrimination, and sense making. So it's worth looking here to, into this area to understand education more richly. The arts of learning and empowerment and community are deeply related to the probes that esoteric practitioners have been making toward the roots of our engagement with the world, with perception, and with the self-overcoming of the self. And I think if we could reverse engineer the practices of shamans, witches, saints, prophets, Gnostic intermediaries, etc., etc., from our deep history, we might be able to regenerate an adaptive educational ethos that goes beyond just the pedagogy of skills, training, and socialized knowledge into a realm of understanding, development, and regenerative transformation for planetary civilization. And one of the reasons we might want to pay close attention to that to the more ecologically embedded and nature emphasizing versions of wisdom and development and deep education is that a huge part of our contemporary epoch is now defined by the destabilizing rupture between planetary scale human social technological and economic needs on the one hand and the regenerative reproduction of a self-regulatory naturalness in the biosphere on the other hand and the surface level of our cultural discourse around the moral value and utility of education seems to be stuck in an endless argument between traditionalism and progressive diversity, between myth and science, between fixed and flexible identities, between conformity and inclusion. But we might instead urgently need to prioritize a different educational ethics for tomorrow and the day after. Um, a wisdom uh, educational ethics of wisdom that emphasizes existential growth, intersubjective capacity, and participatory ecological savvy of some kind. If we have a thriving regenerative world in which techno-social patterns collaborate with ecological patterns and we have deep people working together meaningfully, we can probably solve all of our other material and social problems. If we do not have a thriving regenerative world, if we have techno-social patterns that deviate from or disturb ecological patterns, if we do not have deep people working together meaningfully, we probably cannot solve any of our other material or social problems. So let's come back to the title of this talk. Three things are implied by the title of this session. They are inner practices, biospheres, and needs. What am I talking about with these words? Well, first of all, inner practices are the the full suite of ways to evolve our cognitive experience, our embodied understanding through intentional attention practices. Um, inner practices are motivated modifications of how psychology and consciousness function, often grouped under the heading of meditation or yoga or more generally psychotechnologies. And their goal is to grow us deliberately on an ever unfolding trajectory of learning, complexification, self-fulfillment and self-transcendence. The biosphere is the self-regulatory capacity of the symbiotic, cooperative, and competitive organic systems that make up life on Earth. The general terrestrial biosphere and also smaller experimental biospheres, such as the famous Biosphere 2 project, and also every attempt to allow people to live on submarines or space stations or prototypes of Mars colonies. These are all deliberately cultivated, complex, self-regulating, multivariable organic systems, or sub-biospheres, we might call them. Defining needs is a bit trickier. Um, we often hear a facile but sometimes revealing distinction about distinguishing between needs and wants 
that kind of discussion offers us the chance to be more authentic and more pragmatic in how we think about our needs, but it's not necessarily the case that everyone has the same needs or that the most general and simplistic things are the real needs and everything else can be dismissed as ephemeral wants. Needs are relative to contexts and to normative desired outcomes. I need to breathe, yes, but only if I want to live. So in some ways, uh, needs are subordinate to desires. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to imagine that the minimum dignity upon which to base the word need is the perpetually unfolding existential self-development of individuals and communities within a thriving multi-species biodiverse biosphere in which the constant adaptive reconstruction and preservation of a planetary wisdom civilization can occur in ways that allow for maximum distributed sovereignty and novelty without loss of coherence and security for the greatest number of sentient beings. So as much as that sounds complicated, I think it's probably the minimum frame needed to engage a discussion about the needs of the biosphere. The biosphere needs to be helped and to help us to do all of that. Now, in some ways, I give that just as an example of a frame. The question for this session is whether there are approaches to inner practice and particular frameworks or stories around developmental praxis that align with what we're doing as inner beings, as learners in a profound educational ethos that lines that up with the biosphere's needs. And it's not important that we agree with a particular frame, but that we start to inspect the types of framings that might play a role in all of this. The one that I just uh, complicatedly mentioned exhibits a quality that I think is important for frames around the biosphere in general, which is its double function. That the biosphere needs, on the one hand, to adaptively stabilize, needs us to anchor more deeply in its sustainability and regeneration, and it also needs to change and grow and flower and transform as is appropriate. All organisms have restabilization and growth needs. Like uh, the seedling of a flower is rebuilding itself constantly, but also simultaneously constantly building toward its radical shift into a flowering mode at some point. So if we want to think about the question of how self-developmental inner practice as the core educational process serves the needs of the biosphere, we need to think of how it serves both of those needs. The needs of the biosphere to secure itself in ways that we like and which, and which seem to create richly thriving, broadly stable, recurrent complex cycles, and also the needs of the biosphere to grow beyond itself, to fulfill itself, to flower or move on to unknown phases of its great life. Uh, James Lovelock, who proposed the scientific version of the Gaia hypothesis, associates life in general and biospheres specifically with negentropy, uh, which is a notion of the general decrease of entropy in particular zones. What that suggests to me is that the biosphere should not be defined merely as the presence of organisms all over a planet, but rather as a particular effect produced by a particular arrangement of all those parts that exhibit a common quality. So I might define it very vaguely as a sufficient amount of biodiversity that is sufficiently entangled to produce the gestalt side effect of entropy reduction or the production of a coordinating coherence across that variation. And if we meet that threshold of interweaving and biodiversity, the emergent effect is something we would perceive as the distributed self-regulatory capacity of the biosphere. But then all of that is the biosphere simply perceived as an inherited objective fact, right? We could just look at that and say its needs are then to be mapped and participated in such a way as to sustain and protect the correct coherence generating ratios and our education and our inner practices should be organized to allow us to function collectively as good gardeners, specializing in maintaining adequate biodiversity in adequate interaction. That's good, but we should also be considering a story that is maybe more non-dual, makes better use of the complementarity of opposites. And the complementarity of opposites is a form of cognition trained in esoteric spiritual schools. It's the both andness of things. Should we be trying to restore our ecology or to get off the planet? Yes. We have to decide in favor of both because at a deeper level, they form aspects of one shape, 
right? One Mobius strip with two sides. And this is a very generalizable sense-making principle. Right. We might, for example, ask whether or not the birds of the air and the lilies of the field in the Christian metaphor are sufficient or insufficient as they already are. And the answer is yes. They are perfectly appropriate and content and also yearning desperately for their next phase. That's all one shape. But to think in that way requires that we do something like non-dual pondering rather than keeping our thinking at the social surface layer where opposites are presented as fundamental alternative choices where you're supposed to pick one and join a team. Inner practice is a large part of what allows us to get more clear and more comfortable about simultaneous interactive structures, not just simple static alternative structures. And facility with forms of this kind is a developmental capacity resulting in many cases from the accelerating influence of inner practices. Um, there's a great line I was thinking about earlier from the poet Dylan Thomas. Um, the force that, in, that through the green fuse drives the flower drives my green age. And I was thinking about the possibility of our planet to cultivate a green age for itself. And I think that requires us to feel and imagine the yearning that pervades nature, the striving to become more and other, but to imagine that perfectly in tandem with its already sufficient and completed nature and also its cyclic and self-repeating nature. These are non-contradictory. But to work with that, we must be good non-contradictarians through an education that inclines <laughs> us to make the effort to hold different perspectives together and to tolerate the cognitive dissonance that is initially involved in that and to make the necessary creative efforts to integrate them into higher order structures of sense making. So all of that is a kind of inner work that the biosphere might need from us. It's also possible the biosphere might be said to require from us a competency for ecological ethics. What kinds of inner work might make us more good as far as the biosphere would be concerned if we attributed sapience and agency to it. Now, it seems to me that there are two strong sources of ethics for human beings outside of simply duplicating what we see and hear conventionally as the performative altruism of the societies around us. Beyond that, there is something like refinement through intentional remorse and something like an increase in our clarity about the good or the specifics by which better and worse are expressed in particular contexts. So I'll take the first concept. What is the role of the inner practice of remorse in the development of an ecologically aligned or biospherically deep ethics? Remorse is an interesting concept that involves suffering our responsibility for insufficient actions, even if we could not have done them differently. It's not the same as guilt or shame, in which the voice of others is internalized to berate us about choices which upset them. It's more personal and more voluntary than that. In remorse, we volunteer to feel bad about the mismatch between our actions and our values. Instead of assuming we were acting correctly or assuming we even know the correct values, we allow ourselves to experience the friction of the incongruity under the assumption that that is a developmental and educational act an intentional act, that regardless of the particularities of what we've done or not done, our ability to choose to feel remorse as an exercise educates our behavioral being, not just our mind, but our behavior in the complex art of goodness. And to do this in ecological terms is an interesting problem. We've barely begun to think about it. It would seem to me that we would first need to remove two forms of superficial ecological ethics that might be generally inhibiting our ability to suffer what it takes to upgrade our biospheric agency and responsibility. The first form of that is the transferred or projected responsibility. We tend to involuntarily suffer from the ecologically insufficient actions of others. We are frequently bemoaning the anti-ecological actions of people and systems and corporations and governments and wrong-headed and misinformed voters. Why are they killing the sharks? Why are they squandering the freshwater supply? Why are they paving paradise to put in a parking lot? 
And obviously we have financially incentivized algorithms or so-called news that wants us to be constantly morally agitated by the actions of others to keep our eyeballs on screens. So there are large systems directly engaged in trying to make you feel morally upset about the way that other people are disrespecting nature and the world and our resources. And it's absolutely true that they're doing that, people in general and large systems in particular. But that fact doesn't make you a better person. It does not put you in the position whereby you can undertake a practice of remorse in order to become more responsible to the biosphere. So that's one form of superficial ecological ethics we might want to bracket. The other form of superficial ecological ethics, perhaps, is the sense of compulsion to engage in easy, socially applauded token gestures that have little or no real impact. Right. We talk about corporations greenwashing themselves, making deceptive ecological presentations to commercially exploit people, but the reason that works is we're all too happy to buy the package with the green coloring or the leaf on the outside. <laughs> Most of us, when we can, will pay a few extra cents for something that says eco-friendly, regardless of whether we have any reason to think it is or not. We separate our recyclables, even if we periodically read articles saying that our local city is just shipping it to the dump. We like to wear little stickers or hold up signs or put things on our car or do our part to conserve water, even if 90% of the waste of the water is being done unskillfully by huge production facilities and golf courses, and our governments are refusing to make even small gestures to purify and distribute it, mostly unlimited ocean water, etc., etc. So the role of individual citizens, even if they all took action, which they won't, would often still barely make a dent in these situations. But in these gestures, which we make out of a sense of ethical responsibility, these not that good deeds, they calm us down. They move us away from the internal friction, the upset that might allow us to become uh, better, more solid, more good, higher integrity beings relative to the biosphere. So perhaps the least we could do in terms of an education-like internal progress is to actually feel bad on purpose about the ways in which we are personally behaving suboptimally from an ecological point of view. Does our own unfiltered water flow directly back into oceans and lakes, right? Does our car contaminate the air we all need to breathe? Have we made the soil in our backyard more or less fertile, more or less capable of complex water drainage, more or less populated by the mycelial networks necessary to create interactive resources between plants? Right. Do we understand the role of heat in ocean circulation? Are we even helping our own gut bacteria to thrive? Right. The possible questions here are endless. Uh, and it's not only not possible to immediately change your life to accommodate all these factors, it's also, of course, not useful for us to wander around in a depressive attitude bemoaning your own participation. But it may be useful for you to do this on purpose as part of a regular exercise, as if you were doing yoga or push-ups. Maybe you can sit down for a few minutes each day and really try to feel really bad about the ways in which you are not embodying your own current highest ecological understanding and values. The ways in which you are an insufficient ally to the earth. And the point is a productive one. The point is to gain energy and clarity and integration between different facets of yourself, to opt into the discomfort that catalyzes the growth of integrity. And again, this is the kind of ancient practice that can be done in many ways on many themes, but we might want to start thinking about how to cultivate an ethos in which it's obvious to us that we should do this kind of work relative to our participation in ecologies and biospheres. So remorse is a possible form of inner practice relative to nature. Another one which is often underemphasized in terms of moral and ethical education is in the concept of discrimination, a specific kind of distinction making, maybe what an eco-Buddhist might call right naturalness, the discrimination between thriving and non-thriving organic systems. It's such a simple thing, but it's also so endlessly unexplored. We all have a sense of this distinction, but we could all get way, way better at it. It could be an entire curriculum. How does a sick person differ from a healthy person? How does an oasis differ from a desert? How does a poorly tended plant differ from a well-tended plant? What does a thriving mycelial network demonstrate that a degenerate mycelial network does not? 
Questions like this draw our attention to the specific feature of more or less thriving. We all think we kind of know this, but maybe we understand it at the grade one level, and what we want to get to is something like a post-secondary level of this. How can we get smarter, consciously and instinctively, about the specific characteristics that condition the thriving of organic systems? And that would require an intentional practice of observation of this difference, getting better at seeing and feeling and articulating the details that distinguish more from less flourishing systems. If someone asked you to say what distinguishes a flourishing complex organic system from a non-flourishing one, would you have anything in particular to say about that? Are you educated in that regard? So our ability to participate in the co-production of biospheric flourishing may depend significantly on whether we know what we're talking about in that regard or not. How strong or how clear is our evaluative instinct when it comes to making this particular distinction, which is of course always complex and always on a sliding scale, but it's nonetheless a very meaningful form of perception one which can educate us, but which will not educate us unless we approach it in the mode of intentional inner practice. It's a form of perception, and I, yeah, I want to come back to perception here, to highlight perception as a function that operates between biospheric needs, inner practice, and education. Because education is, in some respects, the reception and assimilation of certain impressions. Impressions also flow into us from natural patterns when we interact with them. Suppose you see a neat bug, uh, right? Maybe today you reach for your phone to take a picture of it, but what does it mean to spend an extra moment looking more closely at it instead, intensifying your gaze at its qualities and details? That's something you would have to do on purpose. It does not occur automatically. The instinct is to move on now or to make it social, which is what taking a picture is. You would have to exert will, which is a form of inner practice, to see more deeply into the thing that you have already affectively and perceptually detected as an interesting feature of the biosphere. This, this kind of area has a lot of facets to it, right? We can ask ourselves questions like, how do we find a rich impression that might be educational for ourselves? And two, we can ask questions like, how do we assimilate impressions from the biosphere more thoroughly? Uh, a rich impression is usually characterized by organic complexity and intrigue. We can simulate that with art, but it's really pervasive throughout ecosystems. You just have to go into nature and you'll find something complicated that you don't immediately grasp. And the patterns of nature exceed us in many ways if we are attentive to the affective qualities that highlight the seductive excessiveness of its patterning for us. But when we find something neat, how do we take it in better? Right. The first thing we may need to do is pay more attention where our attention is attracted. The second thing we want to do is uh, bracket the functioning of labeling, which requires a certain metacognitive effort because you're modifying your intentional practices. Can you bracket your existing knowledge and labeling of nature so that you can directly inspect form, function, and behavior, including how it makes you feel and what it produces in your body and whatever kinds of non-linear or non-standard associations your subconscious might make with it? There are many specific techniques for trying to receive complex impressions more deeply, but the most pertinent feature is simply wanting to do so, wanting to take it in more deeply, and understanding that you have to exert some intentional, attentional control in order to do that. Complexity and impressions are really intriguing features of all of this because they seem to run interference between natural systems and emerging computational models. What does that mean? Well, if you read Stephen Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, you'll find that he argues that uh, the laws of computational complexity are becoming the new standard for educating our understanding of reality, but that this shift requires us to develop a new intuition about how patterns operate. This intuition occurs as we hold attention at the edge of complexity. In the mid-20th century, we started to see that if we ran recursive equations through computers longer and faster and farther than we would process it ourselves, the results were these fractal patterns that seemed to resemble natural phenomenon like shorelines and mountain slopes and the relationship of branches to trees. And we've gone much farther since then into a territory where the patterns themselves are like natural forms, where we have to deal with them through means other than simple linear 
compression and coding and prediction. We have to instead grow algorithms, hunt for models, explore information landscapes. I used to play with a software toy called Wolfram Tunes that made novel music out of irreducible computations, meaning that no one else had ever heard that piece of music and that your human ear couldn't guess what notes were going to come next. Human music is, in a sense, very repetitive. It's simplified. We often can guess what comes next, and that's how we can join in with a song. We anticipate the beats, anticipate the chorus, either from having heard it before or from all other music. But natural patterns are not really like that. We cannot tell at a glance where the tree will put the next leaf, or how the eddies are going to whirl around in the river, or what shape the clouds are about to become. So the internal exercise of holding yourself at that threshold is very interesting. The threshold of trying to see the pattern, but having the pattern escape your attempts to recognize it. Nature is full of this opportunity of meditating to train ourselves at the edge of the perception of complexity. Automatically, we usually tend to either uh, reinforce our models when we encounter natural complexity or just let go and try not to predict at all. But it requires an intentional move to select and pay attention to the gap between our ability to predict and the complex richness of the unfolding. And that's where we would get educated into this new intuition, according to someone like Wolfram, because most of the patterns, most of the possible computations in existence really are that complex. Hmm. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, two interesting features of the Gurdjieff mythos. I published a book earlier this year called Gurdjieff for a Time Between Worlds, which you can grab on Amazon if you're interested. But it looks at the personality and teachings of this obscure early 20th century Armenian sage through a metamodern and a metashamanic lens. And one of the things that stands out to me in his work is his attempt to seriously, playfully generate mythologies that connect inner practice to ecosystems. I'm going to touch on two of his attempts to do that. One I feature in the book and one I don't. The one I don't feature is a very fanciful idea that the atmosphere becomes toxified if we don't draw prana down from it. You probably know prana is the idea of a subtle life-friendly energy that is coupled to the oxygen molecule, meaning it can be breathed in and assimilated into the subtle feeling of our somatic body. Whatever the real physics, whatever the real ontology might be, people have found this very useful for thousands of years to bring the mind to bear on the subtle stimulations associated with the intake and assimilation of breath with effects that range from slight relaxation or improvement of the immune system all the way up to Buddhahood and extraordinary capacities. Many people have undertaken breath work as a major piece of their inner developmental journey over the millennia, but it has seldom, if ever, been placed in a specifically ecological context. This is what Gurdjieff experimented with. What he proposed imaginatively is that we think of the atmosphere as being like a cow, sort of in pain from not being milked. That the pranic element builds up to critical levels and starts to curdle. It oversaturates the atmosphere to create destabilizing weather, toxic smog, and other effects that humans would consider to be bad air. And he puts the blame on us. We're not doing our breathing practice enough or deeply enough. We're not cultivating the ableness to frequently draw down the subtle energy of the atmosphere into our bodies so that it can go through its full natural cycle and return refined to the atmosphere, changed by our deeper energetic and cellular systems. Now, as preposterous as that is, it represents something comparatively rare and possibly essential, which is to begin imagining that our inner practices are functions or extensions of the natural systems in which we evolved. The underlying idea to begin playing with is that the purpose of your inner work is not for you. It's for the biosphere, and your benefits are happy side effects from doing your ecological service for the planet and for mm -hmm. the species. Mm -hmm. So here's another Gurdjieffian myth fragment that probes for possibly synergizing ecological sensibilities and in inner practice. It goes like this. Say the biosphere requires a certain kind of spiritual energy to organize itself, a special high-grade or blended energy in order to harmoniously regulate all its different interacting and multidimensional symbiotic systems. 
And the normal way that biospheres growing up within solar systems in the universe get this energy is that they evolve a sapient species who makes special efforts to integrate their own diverse internal intelligence systems to produce quantities of this special energy, which he calls a skokin. And we produce that by transmuting our suffering and by taking in information with one system, such as mind, body, or heart, and making efforts to connect that with information in one of the other systems, which produces the effect we call understanding. And if we do not produce this energy through our inner exercises, the biosphere then does not have enough and becomes destabilized, and even the solar system itself suffers. So it's the same interesting shift again. Understanding and complexification of the nervous system is not viewed as an end in itself, nor is something like enlightenment, but as the side effects of serving the self-regulatory functions of the biosphere. That's a possible and potentially crucial over time shift in framing from the frame of, let's say, spiritual materialism in which we're trying to perfect and upgrade ourselves. We could move from that towards a more what we might call indigenous notion that the development of wisdom is primarily our participatory and necessary function within the ecology and its effects on us personally are a happy accident, a bonus incentive. Now, of course, we don't all have to become Rejeffians or buy my book, although definitely buy my book. Uh, we don't need to take someone else's ridiculous mythology on board. But what we might want to start doing is to ponder and experiment with the imaginal production of narrative symbolic and mythic frameworks in which what we have considered to be the essential educational shift for human beings can be understood or pictured or felt as intrinsically combined with the well-being of a biodiverse living intelligence system. Uh, we can take a quick moment here to try a kind of Grigefian practice because if you're familiar with what he proposes in terms of producing these higher energies, it's mostly got to do with harmonization between different internal systems. So if anybody's available for this exercise for a couple of minutes, take a breath and feel the entire somatic, possibly tingling interiority of your physical body. All of the inward and outward possibilities of physical sensation. And while you're doing that, begin thinking about everything you know about the ecosystem of the planet Earth, everything you've heard or seen about the biosphere. And that's going to require a little bit of mental work. And as we continue to hold the sensation of the whole body and think about everything we've heard about the biosphere, we can also start to feel all the emotions we've ever had about nature every kind of emotional response to the natural world. This is a very tricky, complicated thing to do, so you won't perfectly succeed at it. But try to put equal amounts of attention into thinking about the biosphere, feeling about nature, and sensing the whole of your body. And just see what that does in a couple of minutes.
So imagine putting five or ten minutes into something like that each day. Getting really good at it. Got a couple more ideas I want to throw out with the couple of minutes we have left. I think one of the things that really stands out to me is that the biosphere can be considered as a model of non-individual, non-rational, distributed interactive intelligence, uh, meaning that it's complex, intelligent, powerful, and operates outside of the linear waking state, rational consciousness uh, that our waking personalities seem to use, in which we imagine ourselves as discrete, separate, unified beings. Uh, the image of the biosphere is that of a distributed, interactive plurality, and our traditional human images of ourselves are as a kind of divinely gifted or socially reinforced unity. I'm me, I have a single character, I have a will, I'm an individual, I'm conscious, I know my consumer preferences, I'm centralized and unified. Now, it's possible that inner practices framed as individuals working on themselves, as unities, watching their singularity, disciplining themselves, may not be the right kinds of models for a wisdom education that is in concert with the biosphere. It may be that we should be leaning significantly to preference developmental approaches rooted in the notion of the self as a distributed relational plurality, and that that would be necessary to make the unfolding of our inner work available to biospheric resonance. Approaches, for example, like parts work. Approaches like the one we just played with, where heart, mind, and body are players, ourselves, in the exercise. Approaches where flow states and peak experiences, which are essential to the organizing of inner practice, are not interpreted as fulfilling or surrendering the one self, but rather interpreted as moments of intensified teamwork, amplified inner coordination between a diverse set of subjective functions. Right? Perhaps over time, approaches rooted in this framing that, does not tr that treats human psychology as an ecosystem uh, are fundamentally the ones we would need to pick up and privilege in order for the outcomes of our practice to be consonant with the needs of the biosphere and the ecosystem. Um, we could take a look at neo-elemental practices. Um, one interesting question for me is always, what do the Wim Hof method and biomimicry have in common? Wim Hof is a physiologically peculiar individual who can fight off viruses notably well and sit naked in freezing ice. And he considers these to be normal ancient human capacities that can be activated by a combination of exposure to thermal intensities, shift of mindset, and a special breathing technique. His system is an embodied skill learning process that emphasizes inner practice, but he says the breathing practice was taught to him by the ice. That is to say, the, the pedagogical frame is inherently in alignment with an ecological context. Very similar with Leonard Orr, the founder of the rebirthing movement. He says their continuous circular breathing practice occurred spontaneously in response to the effects that water and darkness were having on him in flotation tanks. So there's the sense where uh, esoteric practices are educated into people through their relationship with elemental or natural circumstances. And there's a parallel between that and what we now call biomimicry, which is our sort of knowledge-based and technological attempt to inspect the microstructures of living systems to mine them for solutions to our architectural and chemical problems. Has nature already solved a problem like this is the question in biomimicry. But biomimicry at the scientific and techno-social level is encoding patterns from nature into human structures. And Wim Hof and Leonard Orr are doing something similar by sheer exposure to natural intensities, in particular intentional states of attention. A concept like participatory enacted imaginal ecological duplication applies to all of these things in their different domains. Uh, so many more things I could talk about here, but I see we're right up at the end now. So uh, if you've had your eyes closed, open them up, shake and wiggle. Uh, we're coming to a close. Uh, there are a lot of things we could do to help the biosphere and to use it as the context for ongoing educational culture. 
We can build community around bioregions. We can emphasize group ecological tasks as the primary situation in which to have developmental practice and discussion. We can make the needs of the thriving of natural systems into a greater focus in our ordinary educational processes. Many more ways into this than I've had time to share so far. But basically, we need to begin a conversation around a shared transcultural need to get way better at conforming human civilization, knowledge, intuition, and cultural praxis around the cultivation of thriving, biodiverse, non-polluted, self-regulating, and even self-unfolding ecosystems. We have a possibility to make it central to our thinking, central to our education, and central to our personal development practice and the way we frame that. We can think of begin to think of our psychotechnologies, which are at the root of our educational process, as being fundamentally situated within and for the biospheric situation in which we have fundamentally come to exist in the world. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you accepting questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. Do I don't? Yeo, do we have time for questions? Well, I don't. I don't see if anyone of uh, is waiting for the, as a tech host for the next uh, session here. Uh, I'll uh, just say me, and if not, I'm happy. I have to hold the space anyway. So like, okay. Well, let's. Uh, go if ahead, you've got a question, or if, if you're one okay or two, with go that, ahead. Layman. I have a very, I have two very brief questions. One is, sure. today for your uh, presentation, were you reading or were you transmitting spontaneously or both? Uh, both. Um, some, some sections were preset, others will have notes and some were spontaneous. So uh, a mixture and also something in between. You were jamming in that. Okay. And then the other is, um, I'd love to know about your headwear. Um, and the end, what's what's going on with that, and um, or your intention of wearing it today? Is there a, a, just a decorative? Uh, these are some. Uh, I got these when I went down to Toronto for the Greater Toronto Bioregion Conference recently, and they were a gift. But I thought I would wear them, but uh, it turns out the lenses are like kaleidoscopes, and I can't see a thing when I've got them on. So I just moved them to my head. And also, I think we have a sort oh. of. I mean. Uh, conferences and talks can be uh, very formulaic and very banal, and so I think we have an obligation to be a little bit whimsical in our decorations. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, need, I need lenses like those. Definitely, I need a couple <laughs> of those here. Uh, thank you very much, Lehman. I, I want to make a question, too, because um, it really resonated with me, this idea of like being able to sustain the paradox or even more like the different perspective that not always align, no? So, and um, sometimes I find people hard to to not stick to a, one truth, you know? We are called ecoversities because we want to be an ecology of knowledge. So if you can share a little bit of how how do you attack this, yeah. this dilemma or, or how could you hold uh, different perspectives? Uh, I mean, I think there are uh, three main ways into getting better at that. And one of them is just having good relations with people who disagree with you so that you have no choice but to sort of uh, take them seriously and, and map it socially with another person. But there's also structures, right? Like a Mobius strip is a structure that exists in mathematics and geometry. And the more we're exposed to structures that are real, but which are sort of trans-dual, uh, the more we can take that seriously as an opportunity for thinking. But from my point of view, the most important one is is the willingness to sustain the cognitive dissonance, right? It's, it's uncomfortable or strange, the sensations that come up when we try to hold two opposites long enough to make sense of them as a team. So it's that commitment to undergo that slipperiness rather than to stop doing it and go for the simplification of taking one of the sides. So we have to kind of get to like that weird in-between sensation. Hmm, thank you. Someone no, else want to pose the question? I just, 
I have one more. <laughs> what context do you normally present your work other than, uh, you know, the written word he, he posted, Ye Yeo posted that you have a substack. Do you have other ways in which you engage with your educational process? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, real world conferences, uh, we run retreats as well, a couple times a year, um, books and sub stacks and podcasts and uh, way too many things. I'm constantly exhausted. <laughs> where is your physical location? I'm in Thunder Bay, Ontario, if you know where that is. Yep. I, I'm right at the, I'm at the source point of the Great Lakes, essentially. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I've got to go now, but uh, I hope we can all uh, keep thinking about the possibility of there being a field of knowledge around this overlap that we're discussing.